My name is Kenny, and I'm the Senior Director of Applications for the AFM Business in Bruker, and I'd like to welcome you to this installment of the Bruker AFM webinar series. This presentation is titled, Recent Progress in AFM in Nanomedicine, Applications of Force Spectroscopy and Peak Force Tapping, and it'll be presented by uh, Alex Perquant of Bruker AFM and Sean Griffiths of Swansea University. Before I introduce Alex and Sean, I'd like to make a few quick logistical comments. Uh, first, we encourage your participation during the webinar, and if you have a question, please type it into the questions dialog box on your screen. We'll accumulate these questions through the presentation and group them together, and then answer them at the end of the prepared remarks. Quite often, we have more questions than we can answer in the session, and in those cases, uh, we'll be sure to follow up uh, with answers to all your questions uh, via email. Also, if you'd like to review the presentation afterwards or pass it on to a colleague, the webinar will be posted on, uh, online in the webinar section of the Bruker webpage. Also, as a follow-up to the presentation, uh, a link uh, containing uh, the, the information to get that uh, download will be sent to you in the email. Finally, when you exit the webinar, the software will ask you to take a brief survey, and uh, we'd very much appreciate it if you would take the time uh, to, to complete this as uh, we use this information to help us pick uh, better topics and topics that are more in, important to you and generally make this webinar series better. <clears throat> so let's get started and let me uh, introduce our presenters. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Alex Berquan, uh, a life science application scientist in his sixth year uh, with Bruker uh, AFM. Uh, Alex graduated from the University of Technology at Compagnie with a PhD in engineering science and is the author of 20 international publications uh, and 16 uh, Bruker application notes. Today, uh, he will be jointly presenting uh, with uh, our collaborator, Sean Griffith, who's from Swansea University Center for Nano Health, where he researches adhesive proteins in the human, human endometrium uh, through a BBSRC Industrial Case Award, uh, which was awarded in collaboration uh, with Bruker uh, as the industrial partner, and the results that you'll see today uh, are uh, part of uh, that, that effort together. So now let me turn it over to Alex, who will present the first part uh, of this talk in the series, again, titled Recent Progress in AFM uh, and Nanomedicine. Uh, Alex? Yeah, thanks for the nice introduction. So as Steve said, during the next hour, we'll be reviewing together a few existing applications of AFM in nanomedicine. After uh, having introduced most of AFM modes that can be used for this, in the second portion of the talk, Sean from the Swansea University will go deeper into details by focusing on his current research topic, which aims at unraveling the cause of infertility at the sub-micrometer scale. First, I will quickly describe what AFM is, as some of you may not be familiar with the technique. Here is a schematic explaining the principle of AFM. The main element of an atomic force microscope is a sharp probe mounted on a cantilever. Um, which is about 200 micrometers in length, which is scanned over the sample surface following its profile. As the sample is never perfectly flat, even at the atomic level, each local change in topography will cause the cantilever to be deflected. A laser beam is sent onto the reflective side of the cantilever, which is the back side, and the laser spots will be moved according to the bending of the cantilever. So the primary goal of an AFM is to generate a high profile, profile of the surface, but actually much more additional information can be acquired simultaneously. Depending on the different existing modes, the feedback can be based on the deflection, like in contact mode, the amplitude, like in tapping mode, or other signals. This cartoon represents the optical deflection system, which is the most commonly used worldwide. The next cartoon explains how FM can be combined to inverted optical microscopy techniques. So the optical stage can simply be replaced by the FM stage, which will move the sample in x-y directions, while the tip remains idle in the case of a sample scanning system. Then the large optical access allows coupling to a wide range of condensers and objectives. To briefly describe the setup, in number one we have the condenser, in two the FM head, with a large optical access. In three, the cantilever holder with a mounted tip. This allows transmission of the white light. In four, the sample to analyze. So you can have different types of samples, like cover slips, glass slides, or uh, tetra dishes 
of various diameters. In six, we have the XY stage that moves the sample in XY. And in seven, the turret with uh, a various number of objectives. This type of AFM can only be combined with inverted optical microscopy techniques and not with upright microscopes. The Biscope Catalyst is a good example of such combination and most of the examples shown in this presentation were acquired on that tool. A direct application of such setup and of interest for biologists is the fact that optical and AFM images can be combined together through the use of overlay softwares like Miro. Miro stands for Microscopy Image Registration Overlay. So the principle is quite easy to understand. The user has to capture three sample images at three different XY positions to define a working window and get calibrated. Then a feature of interest has to be spotted and marked on those three images. Whatever feature, but the same on the three images. Eventually, the user must capture a tip image. After this, a background image, so most of the time a nice fluorescence image, can be imported into Nanoscope and a location can be targeted to perform the FM image. Then the sample will be moved to that position according to the calibration file and the FM image will be captured line by line to finally be overlaid with the optical image. So the main benefit of that is that you can combine FM and optical information on the same image. A typical application is shown on the next slide where live ELA cells have been imaged by confocal microscopy and AFM. The confocal image in the background shows actin cytoskeleton in red, tubulin cytoskeleton in green, and nuclei in blue. The AFM channel in the center is a 3D height image, but actually any AFM image can be displayed, or even a mix of several AFM channels. Also, it's possible to play around with the opacity to make sure the contours of the optical image match the ones with the AFM image. This type of overlay can be used also to target the best locations where to make single force measurements or fault volume images, like indicated by those uh, yellow squares and um, yellow crosses and yellow square respectively. The next slide reviews the major optical techniques that can be combined to AFM although that list is not exhaustive. So mainly bright field, the IC microscopy, epifluorescence, which is about 80% of the, of the existing applications, and also more advanced fluorescence modes like confocal microscopy, turf, FRAP. Also Raman is getting more and more popular, especially Raman derived techniques like TERFs. And on the left side of this slide, you can see the catalyst head view from underneath and showing the cantilever holder with the FM tip. Also the PSI, the perfusing stage incubator, is shown below. So this device can be used to scan cells for a long period of time and keep them alive for uh, a few days if needed. As I said, the presentation will be focusing on mechanical measurements in AFM and nanomedicine. The most commonly used AFM technique is probably tapping mode. So in that mode, the tip is oscillated near its resonance frequency, which is about 300 kilohertz in air or 1 kilohertz in liquid, and intermittently taps on the sample. Together with tapping mode comes the phase signal, which is the lag between the electrical signal you send to the cantilever and the response in terms of frequency. Depending on the imaging parameters and the sample properties, phase images can reflect different things like topography, surface properties like adhesion or volume properties like viscosity or elasticity. But uh, it suffers from two major drawbacks. First, those images are most of the time a mix of those factors and it's impossible to distinguish between all of them. And second, they cannot be quantified. Force spectroscopy is another popular FM technique used to probe the sample's mechanical properties. The tip is brought into contact with the sample until it indents into it and gets retracted. The extension curve reflects the stiffness and the retraction curve the specific or non-specific adhesion between the tip and the sample. So the animation on the right part of the slide is from uh, Jason Bemis, who was made a couple of years ago. And 
explains the differences between the specific and non-specific addition between the tip and the sample. So the scale bar in red, in red is just uh, the duration in time. So after the contact point, the cantilever gets deflected when indenting into the sample. This is what you can see right now. Then pulls off and shows first a non-specific adhesion, as you can see here, and then the specific and binding event. So this is the reason why using a ligo of a certain length can help extracting the specific and binding events and distinguish them from non-specific adhesion. On the next slide is the first example of pulse volume applications in uh, pharmacology. In that case, the authors studied the interaction between a tip function lies with a vancomycin, which is an antibiotic, a drug, and various substrates. First, a synthetic substrate with a dipeptide, the alanine, the alanine, contained in the active site of the target molecule. The distribution of the specific and binding forces reveal a peak around 100 piconewtons. And if the substrate is slightly modified by another, uh, by substitu substituting a D-alanine by another hydrophobic amino acid, which is valine, which is extremely close, the distribution is completely changed and the number of force events dramatically decreased. Now the same experiment is conducted on a live wild type bacteria. The dividing septum seen in, uh, in inset on this image is known to be rich in newly synthesized peptidoglycan, which is the natural target of the antibiotic. The force distributions, distribution that you can see here is very similar to the one found in situation one. Eventually, a last experiment is achieved on a mutant type of the bacteria, which is not able to synthesize peptidoglycan. So as you can see, the number of events drops down by more than factor 10. So this study proves the very high specificity of action of the vancomycin. Next example illustrates that force and fluorescence measurements can be combined together. Live ELA cells were scanned by an FN tip functionalized with a pro aerolyzing This spore forming toxin can recognize any type of GPI anchor protein. The ELA cells were transfected with plasmids, enabling overexpression of GPI anchor protein and green fluorescence together. On fluorescent cells, nice specific events can be recorded, showing an average peak of about 70 piconewtons. On the contrary, non fluorescent cells don't exhibit those events anymore. Or let's say that the number of events is reduced by approximately factor five. So this example shows how you can connect the number of specific and mining events to the fluorescence intensity. On the next example, we use the FM probe, this time as a mechanical indenter, not to measure specific events, but to stimulate light neurons. A tipless cantilever has been functionalized with a glass bead of about 10 micrometers and used to stimulate murid endings. We used the Psi-5 probe to probe the calcium release. Different pulses were applied to the endings by using false volume mode at the scan size zero. And as you can see, those pulses exactly match the calcium releases. The scientific first proves that a mechanical stimulation can be used to induce a biochemical response in live cells, which can be detected by using an IOM-AFM combination. Such study is also very helpful to get a better insight into how pain is mediated between different cell types inside the human body. This next example shows how AFM can be used to study infectious diseases. Septins are highly conserved GPI binding proteins found in all eukaryotic cells, including yeast, that play a role, an important role in bacterial infection. More in particular, in the interaction between Listeria monocytogenes invasion protein in an LNB, and MET receptor, which is a key receptor involved in the kinase pathway and in the infectious process. By depleting or overexpressing the cells with various septines, like number 2 or 11, the cell shape grammatically changes, as you can see here. And the presence or absence of septins on the cell surface can be proved by the detection of specific and binding events on the cell surface by using functionalized probes. These results confirm the role of septins 
in their function of surface receptors in infectious process. All those examples prove the usefulness of using force volume in the field of nanomedicine. Nevertheless, this technique suffers from a couple of disadvantages, like the very slow acquisition speed, the low resolution, and the fact that only stiffness and adhesion can be recorded simultaneously. So up to very recently, there was a real need to develop a faster quantitative technique, allowing the extraction of more information, and if possible, at the higher resolution. This is why Brooker developed a new technique called peak force stepping, based on the scanessence principle, which is fully automated AFM. In this mode, the cantilever is oscillated far below its resonance frequency, around the kilohertz, and each time the tip taps on the surface, a force curve is recorded, the feedback being based on the maximum peak force applied to the sample. And like in other AFM mode, uh, standard cantilevers can be used. If the probe is calibrated before the experiment, all channels will be directly quantitative. In that case, the technique is referred to as peak force QNM, QNM standing for quantitative nanomechanical. So why is being quantitative so important? The cartoon on the next slide shows a description of different cell parts in the human body. The stiffest parts are T, which can go up to 25 megapascal then bone, tendon, cartilages, then the vast majority of organ, muscles, and various cell types go from a few kilopascal up to 50 or let's say 100 kilopascal. And finally, a few cell types like neurons, adipocytes, or hepatocytes, which can be below the kilopascal. So the real challenge is to develop a technique that can be operated on this very wide range of samples which also includes developing the appropriate range of probes. Originally, peak force stepping was developed to work on non-biological samples, but we greatly improved the technique over the last year, over the last two years, and can now come up with a couple of relevant bio examples. Okay. So this schematic shows the general principle of peak force stepping. As I said, it's a combination of oscillating mode and force curve acquisition. First, the tip is brought to the surface through an attractive field until it reaches the contact point in B and start indenting into the sample until the maximum peak force is reached in C. Then the tip starts pulling up until it reaches the maximal adhesion in D to eventually reach back to its original position in E. Again, if the tip is calibrated before the experiment, all the recorded signals will be directly quantitative, which means that the peak force and the adhesion will be expressed in nanonewtons, the Young's modulus in kilopascal, the deformation in nanometers, and the dissipation in electron volts. Now we'll be reviewing together a few examples where peak force QNM was used as an approach technique in nanomedical topics. The human skin has multiple layers of tissue and guards the underlying muscles, bones, ligaments, and internal organs. Because it interfaces with the environment, skin plays a key role in protecting the body against physical and chemical abrasion. It also has other key functions like insulation, temperature regulation, and sensation. The glyphosate has been extensively used in the years 2000 as an herbicide, and although its role is not completely understood, it's known to cause severe impairments like skin cancer. Just an example, in the US during 2007, the agricultural market used almost 200 million pounds of glyphosate. Why glyphosate has been associated with deformities in the host of lab animals, its impact on humans remains unclear, but it's known that it exposure can lead to skin cancer or similar diseases. The existing data tend to prove that ACAT cells, which is um, an immortal cell line, immortalized cell line of human keratinocytes exposed to glyphosate, show a higher rate of asymptotic and necrotic cells than controls. So what you can see in the fluorescence images here is the percentage of hydrogen peroxide, which is actually an apoptotic marker. 
the technique enabling rapid identification of the stress cell is still lacking. In addition to this, this type of cell is usually quite hard to image by using conventional FM modes like tapping mode or contact mode. So this is why in our case, live ECAD cells were exposed to glyphosate and observed by FM, FM in peak force QNM mode. On the control series, the cells appear fluid and move rapidly while scanned by the FM probe. The, gly the glyphosate rapidly induces the production of stress fibers, so changes in morphology are obvious. Moreover, imaging is very stable and cells can be scanned over a long period of time like four or five hours. But Big Force QNM provides much more than topographical information. Mechanical properties can also be probed. On the control cells, both Young's modulus and deformation show an homogeneous contrast, and cells are rather soft and compliant. After glyphosate treatment, the stress fibers are also visible on the mechanical channels and cells become significantly stiffer, typically by factor 3, and less deformable by factor 2. Also in this experiment, it's important to mention that comparing the changes in topography to those in mechanical properties is made easy and possible by the fact that all channels have exactly the same resolution. Because again, a force curve is recorded on each pixel of the image. So if you're interested, uh, this data has been published recently in Journal of Structural Biology in a paper entitled Glyphosate-Induced Stiffening of ACAP Keratinocytes, a peak force tapping study on living cells, and also a shorter version in microscopy and analysis. The authors are Celine O, Celine Eli, and Laurence Nico in collaboration with Broker. The next and last example is about malaria. Uh, malaria is one of the major diseases affecting humans and animals on Earth. It's caused by a bacterium called Plasmodium falciparum, and the protists first infect the liver and then act as parasites within the red blood cells. Just in 2010, more than 200 million cases were reported worldwide, and more than 600,000 persons, most of them being children under the age of five, died of it. As parasites proliferate, the red blood cells break open and new red blood cells can be infected. This infectious state can clearly be seen and related to the shape of erythrocytes. Healthy ones have a donut-like and smooth shape, whereas infected red blood cells are covered with knobs. The infected red blood cells exhibit a higher cytoadherence and easily stick to blood vessel walls and endothelium. Those clogs prevent their elimination by the spleen and create vascular blockages. One of the major molecules involved in this anchorage to the endothelium is called CD36, the surface receptor. To understand this adhesion process and map the distribution of cytoadherence molecules, an FM chip with functional eyes was functionalized with CD36 receptors and scanned over infected red blood cells immobilized onto a cover slip. Those cells exhibit knobs that contain the ligand involved in the interaction with CD36 and called PFEMT1. The result of the experiment is shown in the next slide. On the left part you can see the individual channels like topography and adhesion. So on the topography channel, the knobs protruding from the rest of the cell membrane are clearly visible, and on the adhesion channel, a clear contrast can be observed between the knobs showing very high adhesion and the rest of the cell. Now on the right part of the slide is shown a 3D rendering of the topography with an adhesion painting to prove that the adhesion spots perfectly, so, sorry, to prove that the adhesion spots perfectly match the location of the knobs. This type of study might help us understand how the parasites infect the red blood cells and identify the different actors playing a role in the cytoadherence process and also the infection. So this was a short overview on the different existing FM techniques that can be used to elucidate the cause or investigate a disease at, a disease at the sub-micrometer scale or the nanometer scale. So if you want to know more about the possible QNM applications in that field, 
I strongly recommend you to download this application notes number 135 from the Brooker website and check it out. It reviews a wide range of applications on biological samples and also suggests a range of probes to be used. Now we'll hand it over to Sean who will introduce himself, introduce his team, his university, and will present his current research topic highlighting the data he recently got in full volume and peak force QNA modes. Well, firstly, thank you, Alex, for that uh, introduction. I work in the Center for Nano Health in Swans University, and it's located on the main campus. Um, and we'll call uh, C uh, CNH for short. So the center is well placed between. Here's the picture. Center is well placed between the medical school on campus, a multidisciplinary nanotechnology center, uh, also on the campus, and a local hospital system and a wider NHS trust. So the our center aims to integrate these institutions under a multidisciplinary umbrella of Nine Health. So as you can see, the campus is located on the beach, and this aerial photograph shows a very rare sunny day in, in Swansea. So to talk a little bit more about CNH, it was only completed last year, in November 2011, at a cost of £22 million. And the funding came partly through the Welsh Government and partly through the university, but also with the help of private investment. The, the interesting thing about CNH is it brings together people with medical backgrounds and engineering backgrounds under one roof. And the building's been custom designed from the ground up to house vibration sensitive equipment such as AFM and MRI scanners. So I've talked about NanoHealth. So what is NanoHealth? Well, I would describe it myself as the application of nanotechnology to improve medicine and healthcare. Human health has always been determined on the nanometer scale. This is where the structure and properties of the machines of life work in every one of the cells and every living thing. The practical impact of nanoscience on human health will be huge. And you can see below the European mission statement on nanomedicine and a significant amount of funding is available to us to address these important questions. So this is an overview of the research undertaken at our center. The core of CNH is building nano devices and sensors including fabrication of nanomaterials functionalized with biomolecules. But this has led into development into other areas such as tissue engineering, clinical sensors, and characterization of biological models. My own research focuses on adhesive uh, properties of cell membranes, but this is a small part of the overall activity in CNH. We will have a look at a few examples of applications of nanohealth. So an interesting application, I think, is, is the administration of quantum dots. So Quantum dots, when used in conjunction with MRI um, imaging, can produce high-resolution images of tumor sites. And these nanoparticles are much brighter than the current range of organic dyes used for this purpose. Another nanoproperty, high surface area to volume ratio, allows many functional groups to be attached to the nanoparticles. These can seek out and bind to certain tumor cells. Additionally, the small size of the nanoparticles, 10 to 100 nanometers, allows them to preferentially accumulate at tumor sites. This is because the tumors lack an effective lymphatic drainage system. It's then possible to induce localized heating of the tumor site with radio waves. And this uh, eventually results in killing of the cancerous cells and avoiding collateral damage to the surrounding tissues. So now for some research occurring at Swansea. This is the development of ultra-sensitive biosensors using zinc oxide nanowires that have been coated with antibody. So this is an incorporation of nanotechnology, being the nanowires, with traditional ELISA technology. 
So these could have applications in early cancer detection, whereby you would screen the blood or urine for low levels of secreted cancer biomarkers. But the application we seek to use them for is as a glucose sensor for diabetes. So now this is a case study involving Cashin Beck disease, or KBD for short. This is a chronic endemic cartilage disease, which is mainly distributed across China, involving uh, 15 individual provinces. KBD usually involves children aged 5 to 15, and to date more than a million individuals have suffered from this disease. The symptoms include joint pain, stiffness of the joints, and limited motion in the joints across the body. So one of the causes is dietary, um, is a reduction of dietary selenium, or a deficiency in dietary selenium. And this is linked to um, a shortage of rainwater across this geographical area, highlighted in the map in the top left corner. The, we have a PhD student who is investigating the effect of different concentrations and isotopes of selenium and how this affects the mechanical properties of the cartilage with AFM. So this is a histopathology slide of cartilage uh, showing degenerated cartilage. And this is an example of the center using molecular biology, histopathology, and AFM, and, and developing a new generation of interdisciplinary scientists. So now you know a little bit about CNH, I'd like to introduce our team uh, we, alongside a bioinformatics group, make up the biological arm of CNH. The reproductive biology group, of which I am part of, was formed in 2004 and is led by Professor Steve Conlon. We have lecturers and postdoctoral researchers, and finally, at the bottom rung of the ladder, PhD students such as myself. We also have a team of clinicians based in the nearby hospital and wider NHS trust, with whom we work in close partnership. And this is important because it gives us access to a large patient cohort of primary tissue samples. So the way the group works is that we go to clinic, identify a biological trend in a clinical need area, build an in vitro model system, which allows us to replicate and test the clinical patterns of expression. And we do this, or we try to do this using novel tools such as AFM. So we're a molecular biology and bioinformatics team who are really developing the use of nanotechnology to characterize the functional aspects of clinically relevant um, biological questions. So the reproductive biology group really has two avenues of research, infertile pathologies and cancer of the reproductive tract. So during the menstrual cycle, the ovarian hormones, progesterone and estradiol, act for their receptive, respective receptors to regulate target genes believed to be crucial to maintain the fertile phenotype. So what we do is we study the expression and regulation of these targets at the gene and protein level using real-time PCR, high-throughput protein assays, and chromatin immune precipitation. But crucially, we try and assess the downstream functional effects of the regulation using novel tools such as AFM. So I touched upon the regulation of the menstrual cycle. So I think this warrants a quick overview. The cycle is divided into three main phases. The proliferative phase, so under estrogen signaling, so the hormone cycles here, and estrogen signaling, the lining of the endometrium thickens following menstruation. During the secretory phase, under control of progesterone, the epithelial layer, the epithelial layer uh, undergoes the epithelial to mesenchymal transition. And receptors and markers for fertility are upregulated during this period. So this is the receptor period when the lining of the endometrium is receptive to a fertilized egg come down and implant. And when the egg implants successfully, the embryo can gestate to a full-term pregnancy. So this occurs between days 21 and 24 of the cycle, based upon a 28-day uh, typical menstrual cycle. So should this not occur, then the lining is lost during menstruation, 
and the cycle repeats. So the function of the uterus is to cycle the endometrium in this in this fashion. So now let's talk about infertile pathologies and cancer that I just mentioned. These pathologies are localized to the endometrium, which lines the uterus and, as I said, serves to facilitate implantation of an egg, and also localized to the ovary, which secretes regulatory hormones that modulate the endometrium and provides eggs for fertilization. So when we talk about cancer of the reproductive tract, we are referring to endometrial and ovarian cancers. The infertile pathology patient samples that we have access to, broadly speaking, includes uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, which is a condition characterized by cysts over the ovaries, uh, altered androgen profile, and uh, infertility. Endometriosis, which is the spreading of endometrial uh, tissue into non-endometrial areas, such as the fallopian tubes. And endometriosis can be a precursor for endometrial cancer. And finally, unexplained infertility is defined as infertility which has no defined uh, cause or attributable um, co um, cause. So an inf infertility is described as uh, the failure to conceive after one year of unprotected intercourse. So all our patients are, are compared to fertile controls from voluntary and hysterectomy patients. So my PhD is a BBSRC industrial case award in collaboration with Bruker, as has been mentioned. As part of the collaboration, I spent six months in the company in addition to my three and a half years I've got to do in Swansea. So I'm interested in this receptive window and the expression of adhesion and recognition molecules on the apical epithelial surface. It's thought that an altered uterine component that leads to incorrect expression of these surface markers that may impair the implantation of an egg and contribute to unexplained infertility. We theorize there is an endometrial factor contributing to this proportion of, of totally unexplained infertile cases. And why do I describe this as a systems approach? Because we are studying adhesion at multiple levels, so at the tissue level, using high throughput protein assays. And this relates to the uterus as a whole. And secondly, we are looking at the level of the cell and, and membranes. And this obviously relates to cancer. And finally, and, and most importantly, we're looking at the single molecule level using the high resolution and, and force measurements only afforded by FM. So the clinical output really of this uh, system-wide approach is, is it increases in knowledge of cell cell adhesions across this important interface. And, a, and this will lead to an increase in IVF efficiency and improvements in assisted reproductive therapies. So this slide is just showing a breakdown of the causes of infertility, showing a large proportion of cases that are unexplained. So it is likely that an endometrial factor could be contributing to some, if not many, of these unexplained cases. This area here is the endometrium that we're interested in. This is the schematic of an interaction between the embryo and the uterine epithelium. These molecules here. Uh, are the molecules of interest that I'll talk to talk about a little bit later. Implantation. So previous work done by our group has looked at the gross morphological changes at the single cell level. We see cells treated with uh, progesterone, which is this ovarian hormone I've talked about show changes in height and surface roughness. These changes are indirectly correlated with changes in adhesion proteins called mucins. 
so these Western blots are showing that in the cell lines that um, change morphologically under progesterone treatment, they also showed an upregulation of uh, a MUC1, which is part of a large family of mucins. So what is this MUC1 protein? Well, this is the subject and focus of, of our inv investigation. MUC1 is a 500 kilodalton transmembrane protein, and it's lo located on the surface of reproductive, respiratory, and digestive epithelia. MUC1 protrudes around 500 nanometers into the lumen and has a branched and rigid structure, and this is owing to the prevalence of glycosylated moieties that decorate the protein backbone. Now, these properties of MUC1 mean that it may mask other receptor molecules at the apical surface. Um, there is confusion in the literature as to whether the molecule is adhesive or anti-adhesive. This conundrum centers around the structural properties of the molecule, such as the high prevalence of salic acid residues imbuing MUC1 with a net negative charge, and this could resu result in electrostatic repulsion. MUC1 traditionally is thought of as an anti-adhesive protein that protects epithelia from bacterial and enzymatic insults. But within the reproductive biology setting, which is where our interests lie, MUC1 is upregulated during the window of implantation, suggesting it has some kind of important role. The expression is disrupted in, in endometrial pathologies, and I'll show some data about that in a minute. Structurally, the molecule can exist in multiple isoforms, and the different length variants of MUC1 have been associated with infertility. So a short variant of the molecule was more often found in infertile patients, while a longer variant was more directly correlated with fertile controls. So, as I just said, MUC1 serves as a backbone for these carbohydrate moieties that decorate the molecule. Two of these epitopes, uh, HECA452 and MECA79, I'll discuss them in a minute, have been associated with egg recognition, and they're believed to act through selectins, and specifically L-selectin, which is on the egg. So in accrued attachment assays, um, MUC1 has been upregulated in endometrial cell lines, much like we've done, and um, using progesterone. And it has been shown to reduce egg attachment. So crude wash assays show that less eggs attached with when MUC1 was upregulated using progesterone. So the, what we think MUC1 does is we think that it recognizes the egg initially and guides it to an implantation site. But the important thing is that this site is cleared of MUC1, so other receptor interactions can take over. So linking back to the clinic, published work done by our own team has shown altered expression of MUC1 in infertile pathologies. So immunohistochemistry, shown here, has shown some types of polycystic ovary syndrome, shown an increase in MUC1 expression, relative well, to fertile controls, while endometriosis patients exhibit lower expression. We've also stained these carbohydrate epitopes, MECA79 and HECA452, that are believed to be important in egg recognition. So remember, these are a, a decorated around the protein backbone of MUC1. MUC1 has an alternated glycosylation state in infertile pathologies, so these Glycosylated epitopes also vary in pathologies, hinting at their significance. So now we've identified a potential biomarker for pathology. We set about building an in vitro model using RNA and protein methods to interpret this data. So as this was early days, we used endometrial epithelial cell lines that we'd used before and they are derived from endometrial adenocarcinoma patients. These aren't primary tissue. So the HEC1A cell line on the left here, and shown with a purple bar, is relatively low expressor, and HEC1B on the right is a high expressor, or a very high expressor. So this is our most basic model for MUC1 um, in vitro. We have experimented using 
help by regulating these cell lines with progesterone and estradiol, but I'm not going to discuss that in this webinar. So one of the ways we develop new skills in the group really is active collaborations. So as my PhD, as has been mentioned, is a, an industrial case award with Bruce being partner, I was lucky enough to spend six months in Germany under the expert tuition of Alex. So between last November and this April, I learned the technique of AFM from scratch and really cut my teeth on the Bioscope Catalyst. So firstly, we cultured Hequin A and Hequin B cell lines. And we grew them to confluence and imaged them in tapping mode using the catalyst. Now, confluent monolayers are harder to image for us, but this model best represents how the cells would be organized in living tissue. So we'd moved on a step from doing the single cell work that had previously been done in the group. So next we looked at the mechanical properties using peak force Q&M. And luckily for me, Alex has already detailed exactly how Q&M works. So I'll just describe my results. And we found, looking at Hequin A cell monolayers and Hequin B cell monolayers, that there was a difference in adhesion between the two cell lines, as shown by this big uh, difference in the middle column. So this was independent of other nanomechanical properties. So we've got a difference in MUC1 expression between two cell lines and a difference in adhesion. So we've got an indirect correlation. So now we quantify the differences in, is in adhesion between the two cell lines and we've got different levels of expression of our protein of interest. To directly correlate this um, protein expression with adhesion properties, we used short or small interfering RNAs or siRNAs and siRNA targets the MUC1 messenger RNA transcript for target specific cleavage and this results in a sequence specific gene silencing fact. So we're taking out one gene and leaving all the other receptors on the apical surface intact. So if you look at the bar chart at the bottom corner we can see that we achieved a very efficient knockdown at the gene level, approximately 95% with sRNA treatment compared to control. At the protein level, as shown by these immunofluorescence images, we also achieved a very robust knockdown. So the insert here is cell stained with DAPI, and the green is MUC1 antibody. these are the, uh, the results. If I draw your attention to the top of the slide, when treated with Hequin, uh, sRNA, the Hequin A cells didn't show a massive reduction in MUC1 expression. And when we looked at the mechanical measurements using peak force QNM, there was a trend to a decrease in adhesion, but this wasn't statistically significant. However, when we looked at the Hequin B cell line, which is our high expressor, and we treated with the sRNA to knock down MUC1. We knocked down protein expression by approximately 50%, and there was a corresponding decrease in adhesion, which interestingly was about the same order of magnitude. So we know that this decrease in adhesion is related to our protein because the sRNA only targets MUC1 and will leave other proteins that could be contributing to this intact. So these data are important because it tells us that MUC1 is a primarily adhesive component in the endometrium. Now I'd like to introduce the second stage of our analysis. So peak force QNM had allowed us to probe the membrane properties of the cells and examine the adhesive effects of a reduced MUC1 expression model. In order to directly assess adhesion, we took force volume measurements across a two micron squared area of the cell membrane, but we used the tip functionalized with antibody that recognized the MUC1 extracellular domain, or we used this biologically relevant molecule, L-selectin, which is located on the egg. So we again compared basal MUC1 expression against knockdown in our two cell lines, and the unbinding events were counted and characterized using 
open for the Air Force and artist software. So this is, would be an example of a characterized event and then a retraction curve with no event or no observable event. So when we counted the number of specific events, if I draw your attention to the left of the slide first, when Merck one expression was knocked down, again using the sRNA treatment, the amount of binding between the tip and the membrane decreased as expected. So we've got a tip coated in Merck one antibody. If you take Merck one away from the system, the binding will decrease. However, the tip was then tagged with this biologically relevant uh, Merck one ligand L-selectin that's located uh, on the embryo. And these results showed that when we took Merck one away from the system, the binding between the tip coated in L-selectin and the surface actually increased in our high expressing cell line. So this is a really nice result because these data support the theory that Merck one could act to initially recognize and guide the egg towards a site which is clear of Merck one and where other receptor ligand interactions can take over and allow and facilitate a full implantation. So if Merck one is too highly expressed across the endometrial surface, it may mask the other receptors which are crucial for this implantation to take place. So now I shall just conclude the project. So reduction of Merck one from the surface uh, reduces the adhesive property across the surface and we can therefore say that generally speaking Merck one is an adhesive protein. However, when we consider these biologically relevant ligands like L-selectin they're expressed on the trophoblast, so the egg, the molecule has anti-adhesive characteristics. So this makes it seem likely that Merck one must be cleared or clear areas must already exist to allow full impl implantation of the egg into the endometrial lining. And AFM and specifically the peat force Q&M has been extremely influential and, and useful in understanding these protein and cell cell interactions. So these techniques have not been used before in the endometrium which makes this project unique and it's a real step change from adhesive assays before whereby you incubated trophoblast cells on monolayers and, and used a labor intensive and unreliable wash, wash steps to try and characterize the adhesive profile. So understanding this endometrial interface is key to improving the assisted reproductive therapies. So my final slide really just wants to try and highlight the collaborative efforts and how industry and academia have come together uh, in this partnership. So the blue squares really are the areas of research interest of Swansea University and, and, and my PhD, focusing on the function of Merck one and how it relates to the implantation of an embryo and overall infertility. But we were able to work together with Bruker Nano and, and specifically use their unique tools and, and techniques of peak force tapping and specifically Alex's uh, very uh, diverse skill set and, and functionalizing the probes using force spectroscopy to answer these questions that we can link back to infertility. So finally I'd just like to thank uh, the real key, key players in this collaboration. Without their help it wouldn't have been possible. Firstly Alex for all his time and uh, dedications. I know he's a very busy man to teach um, a total newbie the technique from uh, start to finish. But also uh, Drew Boomi um, for working behind the scenes to make the collaboration happen and Steve Mean and Steve Badger for really allowing Alex to have some time to teach me AFM and everyone in Bruker Germany who was extremely uh, welcoming and uh, uh, helpful to me. And also equally important, my own supervisors from Swansea University Centre of Nano Health, uh, Lewis Francis, uh, Steve Conlon, and other members of the group such as Dare and Paul Lewis who has always been able to answer my questions. Okay. Okay, so I think we're done with the, the presentation. All right. Thank you very much. Time to uh, questions. Uh, and Sean, uh, 
a very nice presentation. Uh, we have a number of questions, which uh, I would like to remind everybody that uh, if you have a question, please uh, find your control panel, type it into the, uh, the questions box. Uh, as they come in, I will try to uh, group them together uh, and uh, we'll answer as many as we uh, can in this session. Uh, and the ones that we don't get to, we will certainly follow up uh, by email. So we have a number of questions. Um, uh, ranging on both the, uh, the biological uh, side of the experiment to some practical things uh, uh, for, for the AFM, uh, starting uh, on the, perhaps on the bio side. So how much, uh, what is the molecular weight of the Mach 1 if the length is over 500 nanometers? The molecular weight is between 250 to 500 kilodaltons. But the reason it's variable is because of this extensive glycosylation on the protein backbone. But most of the time it's a very large protein, very long protein. Yeah, in the reproductive setting, we think the MUC1 is the largest and longest protein sticking out into the lumen. Therefore, it will be the first point of contact for the embryo, and that's why we've put a lot of research and effort into understanding this initial interaction. Okay. Um, what, what, what's the explanation for uh, the elasticity of the HEC1A and the HEC1B being the same? Well, I'd say they're sister cell lines, so HEC1B was derived from HEC1A, but they differ on chromosome number. So I would assume the other mechanical properties to be similar. Yeah, the only difference between uh, HEC1A and B is actually the, the distribution of the surface molecules. So this is why you have such a high difference in, uh, in adhesion. OK. Uh, what's the uh, advantage of force spectroscopy compared to fluorescence tagging if the method uh, of the objective is the expression of the, the Mach 1? Probably because the, the fluorescence intensity, you cannot really quantify the number of receptors, number of molecules at the surface, I would say. So with four spectroscopy, you can really uh, end up with an histogram and uh, and count precisely the number of events and have an idea, a rough idea about the number of receptor of proteins on the surface. And the fact that we can functionalize the probe with biologically relevant adhesion molecules, which are coming down from the other side, so coming from the embryo, gives us an indication of which of these adhesive interactions is, of, you know, the most important or paramount importance. Okay. Uh, that might be a, a good segue to some of these uh, questions, uh, perhaps a, a bit more on the um, uh, uh, practical aspect. And I, I think this was, was covered a bit, but uh, since we're getting a question, perhaps you should re review it. How do you measure the binding uh, events on the cell surface with functionalized probes? Uh, you mean the, the software we use? Or, I mean, generally speaking, um, you can see the events on the retraction curve in any force spectroscopy mode, single force measurements or force volume, and then uh, you have to use uh, an external software to post-process the, the curves and, uh, and quantify the events. So if the tip is calibrated before the experiment, which is always the case in, uh, in force volume, for instance, uh, you will get the events in, displayed in piconewtons, and this is what you can, uh, what you can extract and process. Okay, and then how do you differentiate uh, between adhesion, capillary forces, and elasticity uh, through these methods? Um, well, adhesion and capillary forces uh, are greatly reduced because uh, we operate in liquid. So uh, whatever the mode you use, force volume or peak force stepping, peak force QNM, normally you're not supposed to see a, a very large adhesion on the retraction curve, and uh, the elasticity is calculated from a, from a different signal. So it's uh, not exactly elasticity, but stiffness in force volume, and directly Young's modulus in peak force stepping. So uh, normally it doesn't overlap with uh, capillary forces. OK. So a couple questions here on, uh, on probe choice. What type of probes do you use to measure uh, elasticity on uh, cells? and you calculate the spring constant of the probe before every experiment? So in peak force tapping mode, we use scan-assist fluid probes, mainly. 
and uh, in schools volume we use DMP 0.06 newton per meter. And uh, the, the the elasticity was calibrated on a, on a stiff sample. So in force spectroscopy, you just uh, capture a force curve on the on the glass, or it's a stiff part of the sample, so it can be glass or anything. And uh, and in peak force stepping, the calibration is slightly more complicated. Uh, complicated. So uh, well, we don't have too much time to to talk about this right now, but uh, I can uh, I can answer this question offline if you want. Okay. Uh, along the same lines, is there a good rule of thumb for determining the best AFM probe to use for imaging soft samples? Uh, so, for example, is there a relationship between the modulus of the sample and the uh, stiffness, resonant frequency, and radius of curvature of the probe that you choose? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. So, uh, uh, a concrete answer could take a while, but generally speaking, when you image a soft sample like a live cell, uh, of course, the probe should have a, a spring constant in the range of, uh, let's say, 0.05 and uh, 0.2 up to 0.5 newton per meter if you use peak force stepping or peak force QNM. Um, and in full spectroscopy, usually it's below 0.1 newton per meter. And uh, now, talking about the tip radius, um, it's strongly recommend not to use a too sharp probe. For instance, uh, probes which have a, a tip radius of 2 or 5 nanometers are too sharp, so they will probably poke into the cell. So I would say that 20 nanometers or even more is a, is a good compromise. 20, 25 nanometers can be interesting to work on uh, on live cells, soft samples. Okay, and uh, a, a bit of a follow-up to that. Um, it, what about the viscosity of the, of the imaging uh, medium, both in probe selection, uh, uh, and then also we have a question of, of what uh, what liquid were you actually imaging in for these experiments? So we used uh, hydrophobic buffers, uh, PBS, and uh, we also imaged in the culture medium. So in terms of viscosity, it's very close to water. It's, uh, it was not such a problem to operate in, uh, in any type of FM mode, actually. Okay. All right. And, uh, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just about to say that uh, viscosity for the time being is uh, one of the parameters that we're not able to extract uh, in, uh, in peak force stepping on, or in force volume, but uh, usually when we operate in the same buffer, we can, uh, we can get rid of that, uh, that factor. Okay, we, we have a couple uh, more questions still, uh, but we're a, a little bit over. We're five minutes over, so I think I will uh, wrap it up here, and we will follow up uh, with uh, those questions uh, by email. Also, feel free to uh, send any uh, additional uh, questions uh, directly to either uh, Alex uh, or Sean, and we'll be sure to, to get them answered for you. So I'd like to uh, thank our speakers again. Uh, for the great presentation, and also thank uh, thank all of you for attending, and remind Thanks, you uh, one last time to please take the uh, take the survey the survey on on the the way out, uh, so we can get your feedback on this and uh, and future webinars. Thanks again, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank bye. you. Bye bye.